So the longest game of Super Smash Bros. in history took over 52 agonizing minutes to complete. And this was an actual competitive match between two conscious breathing players at a competitive tournament with legit stakes. How? Well, first, let me tell you a story. When I first joined the Smash community back in late 2014, as a young teenager, I was pretty much clueless with every single aspect of how the Smash games worked. <laughs> and I made videos with basically no knowledge, and with the humor of an edgy teenager. Now looking back on it, these videos aren't very good, but I managed to generate a small audience within the first month, with a lot of the same repeat viewers commenting on every single one of my uploads. And at the time, YouTube had a feature where you could private message other channels. One message I received was from one of these new repeat viewers less than a month into making Smash videos. The person messaged me a link to a set of Smash 64 that had been uploaded a few days prior. YouTube's messaging system was discontinued in 2018, and as a result, every message has sadly been lost to time, but I still remember it extremely well. The message was along the lines of, Hey Ghost, have you seen this? Please make a video that features this. And the first thing I noticed when I clicked on the video was extremely perplexing. I noticed that the video was almost 53 minutes long, and that the title seemed to indicate it was a single game. No, I had never even seen a single Smash 64 competitive match at that point. And I had no idea how this was even possible because every other Smash game I'd watched used a timer of eight minutes. And the longest matchup I'd ever seen, Hungerbox vs Armada in 2012, took 54 minutes across eight games, just two minutes longer than this entire game. At the time, and I thought the match was completely ridiculous and that even if I wanted to, how could I possibly fit a 52 minute game into a highlight video? It was only until about three months later that I started to learn more and truly understand and appreciate this match for what it was. One of the most legendary games of Smash ever played, and there are so many insanely convoluted reasons for why this happened. Starting off with the timer. Melee and every other Smash game feature an optional timer for every versus mode, with every game using a timer between six to eight minutes. This is used as a standard part of the rule set of every Smash game, where when time is up, the victory goes to the player with the most remaining stocks, or in the case of a tie of stocks, lowest percentage. Unfortunately, they don't actually play out the sudden death. But one of the downsides of 64 being the original Smash game is that it has a lot of imperfections that got massively improved in later games. One of them being that this timer option is noticeably absent. I guess Sakurai didn't think it was necessary at the time, but two players set out to prove him very wrong. The game itself occurred in Losers Round 5 at the biggest 64 tournament that took place every year in Peru, TACNA 2014. And the players were Super Boom fans one of the greatest Smash 64 players of all time, and Gerson, one of the greatest Peruvian 64 players of all time, with Super Boom Fan playing Kirby and Gerson playing Pikachu. Now, while Pikachu is the best character in 64, Kirby in 64 is still obscenely broken, as another trade-off of 64 being the first Smash game is the balance. Sakurai, Smash's creator, outright confessed that while making Melee, so many people had been telling him that Kirby in 64 was broken, that he actually went and notoriously nerfed Kirby in Melee to the ground, making him one of the game's worst characters. The people telling Sakurai that were right though. Kirby in 64 has absolutely unreal zoning ability. Several of his best moves have massive hitboxes that go far, far outside of what the character model should be hitting, also known as a disjoint. These moves are essentially Jigglypuff's back air in Melee, but most notable is his up tilt, which has such an insane hitbox that Kirby is the best defensive character in the game by just repeatedly using this move and aerials in order to prevent his opponent from safely approaching. This is especially powerful considering Smash 64 is all about punish game, with the massive hit stun that players suffer when getting hit, meaning getting hit a single time in 64 is often death or a massive amount of damage which is why for a long time it was played with five stocks. So it's extremely risky to approach a Kirby that's doing this. The stage that the game took place on, Hyrule Castle, is also a crucial factor. In addition to Smash 64 having a timer dilemma, it doesn't stop there, because 64 also has a stage dilemma. Stage legality is, and always will be, a hotly debated topic in Smash. 
In order to be a viable stage to be played competitively, there's a criteria of essentially three checks that a stage needs to meet. Firstly, whether or not it has significant hazards. Because while some hazards actually enhance the stage they're on, in the, late oh! the majority of them introduce randomness and cheese. Yo, he's gonna SD again. Oh! Second, whether or not it has the correct structure, such as not having a walk-off blast zone, walls, or a ceiling. You need to be able to kill your opponent off of every side of the screen. And the stage also needs to not be too large or too small. And finally, whether or not it promotes degenerate playstyles, such as circle camping, which is essentially running away from your opponent in a circular fashion across the entire stage typically in order to kill time for a timeout. Now this is crucial, because while many stages in Smash history have met the previous two checks, if there are features exclusive to the stage that would encourage degenerate playstyles, even in the most lopsided of matchups, the stage will be banned. Congo Jungle in Melee is the perfect example of this, because while the stage has no major hazards and a pretty good structure for almost every matchup, Extremely far away upper blast zone and high platforms mean that in a few matchups, for example Peach or Jigglypuff versus Ganondorf, Roy or Kirby, by far the best strategy is to get a small lead and then just circle camp the opponent until they either give up or time runs out. A stage typically needs to meet two and a half of these checks in order to be played competitively. There being a bit more leeway with number one as long as the hazards aren't too obtrusive. Later Smash games such as Melee are fortunate to have at least several stages that meet this criteria. However, Smash 64 isn't so lucky. The game features nine stages, and out of these nine stages, five of them do not even remotely fit the criteria for a balanced stage, leading to them being banned. However, out of the four remaining stages, all of them still have critics with some having bizarre issues such as Dreamland having a glitch where Pikachu's up B hitting a specific spot will literally teleport it across the stage. Oh my god, the glitch! And also that the dark recolors for DK, Captain Falcon, and Samus were widely banned on Congo Jungle due to the fact that the stage is so dark that they would camouflage in with the background and be borderline impossible to see and which stages should be legally allowed in competitive matches was extremely problematic for the Smash 64 community. It was so divisive that which stages were legal varied drastically from scene to scene, with some such as Brazil, where the only banned stage was Mushroom Kingdom, opting to not even bother and to just leave nearly every stage legal. The majority of regions wanted to keep some or all of these stages though, as they understandably didn't want to be forced to play on only two or three stages or even one stage for every single match. But interestingly enough for Smash 64 at the time, two of the strongest regions in the world did exactly this. One was Japan, and in Japan, they played exclusively on Dreamland, with it being the only legal stage and the other was Peru. Except in Peru, they instead played exclusively on Hyrule Castle, with it being their only legal stage. And both of these regions had a claim to being the strongest in the world, had players that are some of the greatest 64 players of all time, but almost never traveled to international tournaments. With Japan's top player Josuke literally saying he would never travel to an international tournament, and that if players wanted to prove themselves, they could come face him in Japan. And for Peru, specifically in Tacna, which is a city where the tournament was hosted, there were a massive number of amazing players that very few people outside of Peru had even heard of. And so occasionally a top player from another region, such as Mexico or Canada, would travel out to one of the big tournaments of one of these regions. And this tournament was one of those instances, with Super Boom Fan along with Mariguas traveling from North America in order to enter which was a huge deal. The tournament was always the biggest event of the year in Peru. Now with the tournament being in Peru, every single match was of course played on Hyrule. But Super Boom Fan notably hated Hyrule Castle. He believed it to be completely unfair that the layout heavily encouraged circle camping and that it should be banned entirely. Now Hyrule Castle is a special stage. A massive number of 64 players will tell you that Hyrule Castle is the stage they have the most fun playing on, and it's unquestionably one of the most iconic 64 stages of all time. 
with some of the most legendary matches and moments in the game's history happening there, especially considering it was never added to Melee, being replaced with Hyrule Temple, and as a result was a completely exclusive stage to Smash 64 for a long time, until it was added as a DLC in Smash 4, which nobody played. Hyrule Castle and Smash 64 are basically synonymous with one another, and many people, notably players like Isaiah, the most legendary Smash 64 player of all time, were heavily against the banning of the stage, and argued that the issues weren't large enough to justify it. Extremely notable is that in 2011, Boom achieved a massive win over Isaiah at major tournament Genesis 2, while utilizing an insanely campy strategy on Hyrule with Fox which specifically worked because Isaiah would counterpick to Hyrule Castle extremely frequently in almost every scenario. And about a year before TAC 2014, in response to Hyrule Castle passing a poll among top players to stay legal, Boom stated that if Hyrule wasn't banned, he was concerned that fair play would go downhill once people start to realize what exactly is wrong with it and start to abuse it. And he issued a warning. If the majority of people still believe Hyrule should be legal, you may have something worse than Genesis 2 coming up for you. And a year later, with Super Boom Fan going to a region that exclusively plays Hyrule, he finally decided to take matters into his own hands. Both players were knocked into losers further along in the bracket with Boom losing to Marka and Gerson losing to Alvin. And after both players won their first set in Losers, the fated matchup would occur. The game started as any normal game would. Gerson got off to a large lead before Boom inhaled him off stage to even it back up. Boom then got a percentage lead and immediately afterwards went to the top platform. Now this is where the problems begin. This is an extremely powerful position on Hyrule Castle, because with Kirby being so high up on the stage, and despite Pikachu being an amazing character, he has no real way that he can approach this safely with the hitboxes Kirby can throw out. Even if he were to try using Pikachu's thunder, it's way too slow. And with this being the biggest tournament that occurred only once a year in Peru, while also being his tournament life on the line, Gerson wasn't willing to just approach in a disadvantageous situation. And so that's what happened. Gerson refused to approach, and so did Boom. And so the biggest battle of endurance and willpower in Smash history would ensue. After the two minute mark in the game, no damage occurred for the next seven minutes. And while there was still a lot of movement and spacing, neither player was taking any risks. There were a few tiny trades back and forth over the next 10 minutes until the 20 minute mark in the game, where for the next 23 minutes, no damage would be dealt to either character. Apparently during this time, Gerson offered to Super Boom Fan to end the game and go to Dreamland instead for a new game. But only if this current match didn't count as a loss for him. But Super Boom Fan rejected this offer. To make things even better, as the match was so hyped up, there was a massive audience that had formed of every player in the venue that had the luxury of sitting there for every single minute, watching the spectacle of the two most stubborn players in Smash history both refusing to back down. For 45 minutes. Hello. 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 Finally, just before the 45 minute mark, Gerson made a mistake and got caught by Super Boom Fan costing him his stock, followed by the most BM taunt I've ever seen. This marked the first stock taken in about 43 minutes. Gerson became substantially more aggressive after this, knowing he had to make up the deficit, and the players actually started having something that would somewhat resemble a regular Smash game. About three short minutes later, he was able to take control of the top platform, which he then capitalized on by taking Boom's stock. There was a gap of about two minutes before Gerson lost another stock in basically the same fashion as the last one. After which Super Boom Fan decided to make it his mission to repeatedly forward throw Gerson over and over until he eventually died, losing his last stock, finally ending the game after 52 minutes and 15 seconds, marking the longest competitive game of Smash of all time. Now, as if this game wasn't enough, the players still had to play at least one more game as that was just game one and the set was a best of three. Gerson again offered to Super Boom Fan to play on Dreamland for game two, but Boom insisted on following the tournament rules. And game two was more of the same, with Gerson again getting off to an early lead, but Super Boom Fan winning in only 11 minutes with the exact same strategy. This loss eliminated Gerson from the tournament, with Super Boom Fan progressing, later finishing third after losing 2-0 to Marka in Losers Finals. 
the player he had lost to previously in winners. Super Boomfan actually attempted this strategy against Marka in both their sets as well, but Marka wasn't nearly as stubborn as Gerson, and he actually somehow managed to clutch out both games that Super Boomfan used this strategy on in only 12 minutes in the first set and 16 minutes in the second set, with Super Boom Fan switching to a different character after game one both times. After the tournament, this game in particular naturally drew a lot of attention, becoming incredibly infamous within the Smash community, sparking a lot of discussion and even being referenced in the game Undertale, with there being a turtle merchant in the game named Gerson Boom. This set is actually the perfect representation of why there are rule sets in Smash designed to de-incentivize degenerate playstyles, similar to the origin of the shot clock in basketball. And ultimately, Hyrule Castle was banned, and 64 matches are now exclusively played on Dreamland, even in Peru. And in 2015, a Smash 64 mod known as 19XX was created that allows you to add a timer to matches. And nowadays, nearly every single match uses this, with a timer of 8 minutes making what happened no longer possible. And just a legendary moment in Smash's history that can never be recreated. Thanks for watching. Hi! You shut up too and stop camping just so you can do that annoying ass time!